security, even as it protects our fundamental civil rights. And Dr. Thompson is, is well prepared to talk on this, not only as he taught courses for many years here at Bill Bell Rock Foreign Policy, Human Rights, International Relations, and other topics. Uh, he's, he's published in, in the Journal of, of Study of Peace and Conflict on the Northern Ireland elections. Uh, he's published a book on national security and fundamental rights, uh, which uh, he's talking uh, tonight, and, and many other uh, publications as well. So thank you for coming. This is the second in a series of lectures on international relations that will be having, uh, sponsored by the Legal Science Department throughout the year. So thanks for, for coming. Nice to have you here, and thank you. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Gustafson, and thank you and welcome. Tonight, um, we're going to just move just beyond the last lecture that we had. Um, last month, as you know, Dr. Barrett gave a talk, a straightforward type of question he asked, are we any safer today after September the 11th, 2001? Uh, this talk that I'm dealing with is American Foreign Policy and Fundamental Rights asks a very parallel question dealing with post 9-11, and that is, have the safety issues in some way pushed our fundamental rights to the sidelines? And if they have, how far have they gone? And the, once again, really, um, because we are a historical type of people, we're not quite sure of what we did in the past, but we are finding ourselves one more time debating one of the oldest issues in our American history as during the Revolutionary War, during the Civil War, during the Two World Wars, um, even the Cold War, and even today, as you know, we're dealing with this question. Security and fundamental rights. Are they increasingly seen as uh, competitive, or are they more complementary? Now, if you're going to look at this core question, there are two vital concerns. One of them is, what is the extent of power or influence or control that the government feels it's necessary to provide domestic security for its citizens? And the second question is, well, how important is fundamental rights to Americans? How should we really look on these issues? The balancing of these two issues is the major problem. How do you balance it without one going too far to the side? It becomes more difficult, obviously, during times of crisis or there's a political force, uh, um, a threat to the actual citizens themselves. So I guess the best thing we could go back to, since most people like to think of American foreign policy coming from the president, you'd have to look at the imperial presidency. And when you look at that, you say, well, it's alive and well today, okay? Where you do have Putin, who is Russia, okay? And then you have Chavez, Venezuela. And then, of course, you have Ahmadinejad, Iran. Well, compared to those examples of what you might call the imperial president, uh, Bush and British and French do not look that bad, but it's all relative, it's all relative, okay? So America really has joined again the list of those countries and governments that are placing greater emphasis on the need for security than they are on the need for fundamental rights for their citizens. Will change take place in the United States? It's inevitable, yes change will take place. And how far will this change go? We're not quite sure at this time, but it definitely is going to take place. Uh, I think really, just consider a simple um, three-sided mock-up if you want to deal with this talk, okay? One is, what does it mean to be secure? I mean, are you talking about national security, or are you talking about the security of individuals in their personal rights? The second one would be, well, where does the threat lie? Is it more foreign or is it domestic? Those two ways in which we are dealing with security and dealing with fundamental rights is a very important one. And the third one is, what is the nature of the threat? Is it just purely physical? 
Is it just uh, a material threat or is it more of an ideological threat, a moral threat, uh, something that is very difficult to pin down, okay? So first, we'll talk about security. What, what do you mean actually by security? Well, most Americans feel that the meaning is, of course, very obvious and it's very constant. For example, the protection of the national territory uh, from foreign invaders, uh, as perceived invaders, and that fits the description of what we mean by security. We want to be secured from those overseas who have a single point of view, and that is to hurt us, okay? Of course, it gets more complicated once you move away from that simple example, and that means, of course, well, uh, you have the problem that you think everyone's after you, you're not quite paranoid, but close to it, okay? Or are you saying that, well, that's the way things are today and we sort of have to accept it. There, there are all different variations when you get into the actual security itself. So the security interest, humanitarian intervention is a good one, okay? Now, we know that national security, the whole security issue, is the real center for the realist thinkers. So if you're into the realist school, national security is the focus. And it protects the legal notion of a state. What is the state that has to be protected? And so the security is indeed an overriding concern in foreign policy in the majority of Americans. They, when they hear the word security, they think automatically of a foreign intrusion onto the territory that we feel is sovereignly ours. Okay. Now, Without national security from any external threat, um, there are other interests, there are other risks that we actually do have. And if we move away from this simple case of security from the foreigners, it really becomes vague, muddled, um, we're not quite sure how far we go, okay? And so very often you can oversimplify it and say, okay, we got national security, we have to protect ourselves. So let's uh, examine three, just three of the historical cases of the United States where we did have physical threat and we also had rights that we're fighting for. And of course the first one would be the Revolutionary War, okay? So we fight for this Revolutionary War and we somehow are given credit for winning the war and we sit down and we say, okay, we'll write the Constitution. And as you know, the Constitution was originally set up to give us a central government, but under control. So only one person brought up the idea of fundamental rights during the Philadelphia Convention. And they talked about it for a very brief period of time, and then they passed unanimously, forget it. We're not gonna deal with fundamental rights because that's the problem of the state governments. They have to provide freedoms and security, okay? Well, as you know, they passed the Constitution and the Anti-Federalists say, we don't want the document. <clears throat> so how are we gonna knock it down? Ah, they didn't talk about the Bill of Rights, fundamental rights, they didn't mention it. And of course they didn't because they were thinking that it was really in the ballywick of the states for Federalism. And so, of course, it became a very important issue. And the, they only passed the Constitution in the last states. If you guarantee us on your honor, you'll give us a Bill of Rights, okay? So there was a sort of a balancing offside, even when we were getting our freedoms that security was more important. And, uh, oh yeah, by the way, we'll give you a Bill of Rights. Uh, that was a second thought, okay? If you move up to another big situation would be the Civil War. And in the Civil War, as you know, there was real problems with people who in Maryland did not really want the Union to continue. And so they made a statement that they would prevent federal troops from going to Washington to protect the central government. And of course, Lincoln could not have that. He tells his general, apprehend people and you don't have to give them habeas corpus. They don't have to have 
the right of this basic right for legal uh, court proceedings. You don't have that. Of course, they immediately went ex parte Milligan, they went to the courts, and it was interesting uh, from my point of view because Lincoln was really being hammered by Tawney. And the reason Chief Justice Tawney didn't like Lincoln, period, was because when Lincoln was running for president, he, in very good argument, showed that the Dred Scott decision was horrendous. And Tawney was the one that wrote the decision of Dred Scott. So he didn't like the president saying that, you know, he missed the boat entirely on this issue. So he says, you can't take away habeas corpus. There's no way you can take it away. It became a big issue in the Civil War, okay? How far do you go on this thing? Until, of course, they made their decision, and you have two of them. It depends what school you want to believe in, okay? You have the... Um, what they call the ex parte Milligan habeas corpus, it passes five to four. So it's one of these borderline things, okay? And that really said that um, the government does not have the authority to apprehend civilians in time of crisis and put them in uh, prison. You, they, it's really not really working. Five to four, t Tony making that decision, okay? However, military tribunals, part of it, military tribunals to try the civilian was nine to zero. That's unconstitutional, okay? Now you understand why Bush, okay, put the detained individuals in Guantanamo Bay. He wanted them out of the country because ex parte Milligan said, if there are courts existing, you cannot deny anyone, anyone, this right to habeas corpus, okay? So Bush says, with good legal advice, let's not bring that up again. Let's go to a place which is not the United States and we'll deal with it from there, okay? So you can see that the Civil War may be old historical news to some people, but it still has an impact today. It still has an impact. Immediately after that, as you know, um, Tawney passes away. Chase, Secretary Chase, becomes a Chief Justice, and he says, you know what, we gotta rehear this thing, okay? We gotta rehear, maybe not Milligan, because he's already had his day in court, but let's go to McArdle, okay? And they came off with that decision, in 1869, and they said that unanimously, we're not gonna deal with the morality, the ideology, the politics. We're not taking that on with regards to human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, fundamental rights. We're not dealing with the moral issue. All we will deal with in the Supreme Court is process, which means that if the president says this is what he wants in times of crisis and Congress says, yes, you can do that, then the court said, <clears throat> we can't touch it, simply because the two governmental branches that have immediate contact with the people, that's what they say. We go along with it. And as you know, that's what the Supreme Court is doing now. Okay? They're following the process of the legal system, not on the morality of the system, not on the uh, ideology of the system, the politics of the system. That doesn't work. <laughs> so they turned the fundamental rights on its head and said, hey, we'll go institutional rather than personal rights. Um, okay, so then you get to the pits, okay? The Second World War, where you have Roosevelt, his order, 9066, when he said, I want to apprehend Japanese American from the West Coast and I want to put him in internment camps, okay? And they did not put any German Americans in internment camps in the East Coast. And they didn't put any Irish Americans in internment camps even though they were dealing with the Germans during World War II. And the simple reason was those German, Irish American, and other groups were too numerous, influential, and powerful. 
So they had to reach out to away from the real power of Washington D.C., go all the way out to California and deal with the Japanese American there. Okay, it was really bad, really bad. Um, it's the real low point on uh, fundamental rights in the United States. Still is the low point. And so, in the Korematsu verdict, uh, the court said you can in immediate crises inter people in camps. Yes, you can do that. You can put people in camps immediately. However, you can't keep them there. In other words, in times of crisis, yes, you can have a crisis. You can take out a group you think may be a threat, but then you can't deter them in military uh, in, in incarcerations. It has to be a civilian incarceration. And so, ex parte endo verdict means that you cannot continue detention by the military. But then again, Bush says, well, it's not on the United States territory. Guantanamo Bay is not US territory. So that's why they, they were very careful in what they chose to do dealing with the uh, terrorist concept in the United States. So also the Second World War concept is really still with us today. OK, here's an interesting one. The, second, the first question was, in a sense, what do you want, American security, national security, or do you want personal security? And in all cases, we have found in the United States that we'll go with security, but we're not letting go of the fundamental rights. We, we just always have that popping up, saying, you're going too far on this stuff. But how about the second question? And that is, where does the threat really lie? Is it domestic or is it foreign? Okay? And much of the US national security and all the decision-making bureaucracy in the United States I can honestly tell you from my experience, they are not able to confront an enemy any longer, simply because it's a new way of thinking. Something else is taking place, and the government's bureaucracy that works on tradition, that works on this is the way it is, uh, it, it just doesn't work anymore, okay? It's like fighting the Cold War against the, the war on terrorists. Um, it's like fighting the Vietnam War in um, Iran, Iraq, okay? It just doesn't work because the bureaucracy is trying to catch up to a great extent. Um, when I said that national territory, okay, we have a thing called geopolitics, okay? And in geopolitics, it started, it was meant to be interestingly trying to figure out why do decision makers take place in government. And you have Mackinder who comes up with the heartland theory and he says the real power is in Western Germany, uh, sorry, Eastern Germany and Western Russia. That's where the real power is because one has industry and one has food. With that, you win. And then people said, well, you gotta get ideology. So then he said, okay, then I'll just grab a hold of this circle and pull it down and make, okay, you have to include Iraq, you have to include Iran, you have to include the Middle East because that is where most of your religions come from. And so it became the heartland theory and on land. But then Mahan, Admiral Mahan, who was an, was an American, he said, well, what about the sea? You know, you have to take the sea into account. And so geopolitics moved from just land to well, maybe we'll take the sea, okay? And th that makes sense. You got the Phoenicians, you got the Greeks, you got Britain, you got the United States. Uh, so we deal with the water too. And then of course, you had John Hurst come in and he said, well, wait, 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 wait. You have land, you have sea. What about the s space, okay? And that's where, you, if any of you remember when the spy plane flew over and was brought down by Russia, okay? That's when all our problems with Afghanistan began, okay? Because when the plane left Turkey, it didn't just happen to wind up in the Soviet Union. It, they had to fly over somewhere in space, okay? And Eisenhower didn't get it. Eisenhower was a linear person that was well-trained in that left side, so he couldn't comprehend space, okay? And what we now know <coughs> is that you have to take it a bit further because the traditional state 
is no longer there. You don't have the whole thing that most people say, okay, you're dealing with the state, you got population, you got territory, you have the autonomy, you have uh, government. Well, that applies not just in s status, which means that the land is there, but if you are not an American, you can still be here. So you can have other nationalities here in the States. And what's happening, of course, is that it's changing. Rosecrans said, well, a virtual state. And, well, that means more, they cannot, the state cannot control the economics, cannot control it. And, and that's what, of course, Europe is just freaking out. You know, their national security is threatened because of the mortgage situations, okay? And it's an international schema that's actually going on. So when you're dealing with geopolitics today, it changes, guys, it really changes, because terrorists are literally changing the way we have to think. The terrorists are population, they do have land, they can be on where there's space and time, they are in some place, okay? And then also, they do follow the authority. Now it doesn't have to be Bin Laden, but it has to be his ideas. Okay, And when you knock out one, somebody else walks in and says, I'd like to take over as leader in this situation. And so what you have is you do have a government. And then you can say anything you want to Al-Qaeda. They do what they think ideologically they have to do. So what you have is a group that has population. They live somewhere, probably in areas we don't realize, but they do live there. They do have their own governmental structure and they do have their own autonomy. They function on themselves. It becomes a virtual regime. And this virtual regime is what the United States government right now is trying to grapple with. Okay? When I gave them that concept in my paper for the American Political Science Association, <coughs> they said it sounds good, but if we start talking about virtual regimes, people are going to think that we're in a penny arcade. You know, it's just not going to work. So they tried regime, and most people didn't get it, okay? And they tried governmental, re no, it didn't work. So they're back to just terrorist, okay? They, they find it difficult to say, hey, let's educate the American public that there's a new way of thinking. And it's not a threat overseas, and it's not a threat here, it's a threat by people who are into violence. Okay, they can be both here and overseas. And that's why Bush is saying that, oh, fight them over there rather than fight them here. Okay? So he's trying to, <clears throat> I, th I think the best word is educate people to see that there is a link. It's not separate over there and over here. And that's something that in foreign policy we realize that the uh, domestic is really up and boils up into the foreign. And foreign, of course, affects the domestic. And the same way with uh, trade and all those elements that are involved. So what we're talking about here is that the management of the interface between these two political perspectives, <coughs> geopolitical, traditional state, um, it, it's really causing a tremendous challenge for policy decision makers, it really is. And if traditional thinking prevails, then the United States will continue to believe that the war on terror is a security issue between specific territorial states and other territorial states, okay? And that's why President Bush said, okay, not only terrorists, but anyone who harbors terrorists. Okay, that feeds into the realist people that feel it has to be a territory. Okay, well, folks, we are harboring terrorists. All right, not voluntarily, but they're here. They're sleepers. It's just a matter of, you know, can we find them before they actually do havoc or harm to us? And so, the security issue is uh, terrorist groups. In a sense, the only way you can get rid of this threat is total annihilation. Now you don't have to get rid of the people, but you have to get rid of the ideology that's driving it. And that's going to be difficult.
which is why it's an educational factor rather than a, a um, military factor. So the leaders that we have in the United States today dealing with foreign policy, they're trying to balance national security with fundamental rights with an emphasis on the security. Because if you don't have the security, all other rights sort of disappear. And unfortunately, the fundamental rights is disputed uh, very often by a terrorist act. As soon as you have a terrorist act, the fundamental rights seem to go right out the window uh, until people start thinking about well, where are they going. Now, the third one I said, you had the first one, is it national security or is it personal rights? And then you have the second one, well, is it overseas or is it here? And the third one is, what's the nature of the threat? Is it really physical or is it really moral ideological? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the security of individuals has a strong connection with civilian rights. And I'm not surprised to see that the first um, Islamic woman put under her burqa the bombs and walked into a crowd and blew herself and 17 other people up, okay? It was bound to happen, bound to happen. And <coughs> this gender thing has to just be released. Another thing is older people. Just because a person is aching and bending over and just about making it doesn't mean that they're carrying weapons around them somewhere. We have to get beyond this age, we have to get beyond gender, we have to get beyond so many of those limitations that we think uh, imp imp imply that a terrorist or it's not. In other words, you're doing profiling. Profiling has to change, okay? So what we're doing here is the state security is not necessarily linked to civilian rights, but terrorism has increased the physical threat and therefore the war on terrorism is leading more to an ideological vision rather than a physical vision. You can see that happening in the United States. Our foreign policy is not looking at the militaristic approach but as you can know it's moving more and more towards the ideological, the moral issue. Okay, And Bush is becoming less a global uh, manipulator, manager, and he's becoming more of a moral crusader. You can see that happening, okay? Which is why, in my opinion, the sooner we get to the next election, the better. Because when you have that word crusader, you're going to really get people hot under the skin uh, with regards to when they don't like what specifically you're doing, type of thing. So, if you have the question, um, the focus on personal rights is receding in favor of, of national security. It's evident, okay? Now, have safety issues pushed our fundamental rights to the sideline? The answer is yes, okay? It, definitely yes. And is that bad? It depends, okay? I, I'd like to say that if you ask a hypothetical question, is it possible that violations of human rights, especially the use of torture, to obtain information, can that weaken the national security of the United States? Well, if you say yes, then you're into the fundal rights movement, okay? That that comes first. It's an absolutist type of an approach. If you say no, okay, it won't weaken the national security, then you're into the democratic movement, that's the Bush administration. They feel that no, it's not going to move us, okay? I tend to wind up be being a typical professor which says, well, maybe it will move us, you know? If I took one side or the other side, I'd be hired by Brookings or AEI, all right? And you go down and you'd be a lobbyist for these people. Um, I thought it was interesting that tonight uh, they were interviewing uh, some the uh, Barack Obama's, um, yeah, I almost said it, yeah. <laughs> Barack Obama's um, foreign policy advisor, okay? And then blah, 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 blah. And then somebody slipped and said, well, thank you very much, and we're glad that you came from Brookings to give us your advice. Ta -da, there you are. Tells you where he's coming from, what he's interested in, what he's actually doing. So those are the ones that are feeding the, the presidential candidate where we're going. So the fundamentalist movement categorically says yes. Fundamental rights are the important element, okay? Now, I think they should fight 
because if they back down, then the democratic movement <coughs> will have the whole field to themselves. That's the maybe part. Well, maybe we should be a little less concerned about fundamental rights right now, but keep it on the front burner, okay? Keep pushing so that we don't have the Patriot Act abusing people. Make sure that um, the prisoners in Abu Ghraib are dealt with respectfully. You know that the um, military personnel have been released. Did you realize that? They were convicted, they were put in for six years, and they were released, um, I think, a day or two ago, okay? Uh, because they felt that uh, the good behavior in the prison, you get time off uh, for probation. So that's still being dealt with today, okay? This idea that uh, the fundamental rights movement is saying, yes, categorically, these people have to have some decency, not only those that committed the torture, but also those who were tortured. You have to have both of them being dealt with. The Bush administration is saying, no, that um, it's not going to weaken the national security in the United States. We can really keep this up. We can really keep battering away at it. The, the problem with that, guys, is that do you know when you have uh, gone too far? Okay, It's like some individuals who cannot perceive that alcohol is affecting them, and they don't realize that they're getting alcohol poisoning until it's too late. So you have to be very careful, not that this is, but it's a drug. It's power. It's literally a drug. And they feel that they can keep going on this. And that's why I was very pleased to see that Bush said, we'll leave this to the next, the next president to resolve. And I said, well, don't make it any worse before the next person comes in. That's basically it, okay? So it's maybe. So each absolutist position is, in my opinion, unreal. It's not the yes or no, but if you put it into operation separately, it's going to be a problem, okay? But if you, it's going to lead us to a really bad future. But if you take both a yes and a no and keep them both struggling on the same playing field, we have a chance. We really do. So keep your foreign policy, national security, yes, you want to be secure but keep pushing to make sure that you have your fundamental rights. The um, amalgamating these optimum features from both uh, can really, it does reflect more faithfully the American culture, okay? We, we are ambiguous with regards to exactly, do we want to go this way, do we want to go that? And that's good, okay? Because that doesn't mean you have a fixed ideological path that you can't deviate from, you can deviate. So I think, personally, my personal feeling is there's a self-writing mechanism within Americans that we are not going to get too uptight uh, when we're balancing it towards a security issue, knowing full well that as soon as this crisis is over, we will naturally want to make sure that the security come, is left behind and the national personal rights come forward. Okay, But Chase was right many years ago. He said, every time a president takes one step forward in power, your rights take one step back because he's not going to give it up and it's very hard to pull him back in. Okay, So basically what I'm saying is that the United States is trying to balance. It's difficult for the American government to deal with the assessing of this during a crisis, but there's hope in as much as we still stay true to our American culture, okay? And that's why it's interesting that we do have all of these immigrants in the United States, they come for a reason, and that's really the American way. Thank you. You had some questions? No, yes. Yes. Um, obviously, President Bush has gained a lot of power throughout his presidency. Um, I'm wondering if there's any sign of like a like Congress taking back any of the power that the president has taken, or if it looks like the president will remain imperial as he is now for a long period in the future. Okay. The question is: Is uh, Congress able? Does it have the backbone to start uh, fighting with uh, the? 
bringing back power to another branch of government other than just the executive. And my blunt answer is no. Congress does not have the backbone. Does not have the backbone. Uh, for reasons of uh, years of not really fighting for what is theirs. Um, if you wanted any reform in the United States Congress, it would be to educate the legislators in the actual role of the Congress. Okay, rather... That seems like something important that they should know. Uh, I, I say that because for four or five years, I was, I was on a panel that when people are elected to the House and the Senate, they have the freshman seminars, okay? And I used to give, my seminar was always called, you've now joined the negative branch of government, okay? And they get all uptight, you know, what do you mean we're negative, you know, we're, we're, we're doing ours. I said, that's the whole point, you're doing your work, okay? That you're being flooded with proposed bills and you, you can only do just so much. And the more bills that you submit, the more work you give yourselves. And that means that you gotta start saying no, 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 no. And next thing you know, you start saying no to stuff that you should really examine. Remember that they did the uh, t talk and they said, well, did you read the bill that gave the president this authority? No, no. Why not? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so it, it really, they have to be re-educated, in my opinion. And I've known them, and I, I've tried to work with them, but it, it's, uh, it's not malintent. It's just that they see the Congress as a great paying job for the rest of your life, okay? And uh, it, it's different than what I would think the United States Congress would be with representation, okay, rather than legislation. They're into the legislative part now. Dr. Yes. Dr. Thompson, do you think the problem is the institution, or do you think it's the, the, the lack of spines in the party that's in power right now, or members of Congress in general? Is it the people, or is it the institution as a whole that's the problem? I can't think it's the people, because that's, this is the United States, okay? And our culture, uh, right from the beginning, we wanted a government that had three branches of government. Okay, and these three branches had one purpose in mind. That's to work very hard at stabbing each other in the back. Therefore, allowing me time to plow my fields, harvest it, sell it, think about how to improve it during the winter, and back off. That's my fundamental right, to exist, to struggle, to deal with it. You're here as an existing to protect us from this concept of a state. It, the state is an abstraction, you realize that, okay? It's, it, as long as you believe in it, it exists. If you don't believe that it exists, it doesn't, because it's an abstraction. And it's what we will, we it pretend that it exists. It's almost like a virtual reality thing here, okay? And so the, the whole point is that that's the way it was set up, to be that way, but Congress is not doing it. Congress is not interested as much. Oh, they don't mind traveling, okay? The Speaker of the House, well, let me go to a place like uh, Syria, okay? And everybody goes, ay, 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 you know? But she has a right to it because she's, in a sense, Speaker of the whole House, so she has that leadership responsibility. But the, the foreign policy is more than just visiting countries, okay? As foreign policy means what's in the best interest of the American people. Okay. And that's the hard part. That is the hard part. And that's why I think Joe Biden figuring, hey, this is my last shot at it. I might as well be a little honest. And everybody's saying, how can you say this stuff? Well, he said, hell with it, you know. I'm going to say what I think because I'm going to be out of here very soon. So you get a little honesty now and then, little windows of opportunity. Okay? Yes? I'm, not, I'm sorry, I have another one. Um, the like hegemonic foreign policy of the United States gets a lot of news coverage, but do you think that our nonviolent diplomacy um, is more, if not or it, as effective, if not more effective currently? Um, if, as you all know, if you take um, 
Dr. Kerbal, if it bleeds, it leads, okay? So if it's exciting, it's murder, it's all types of negative, it's negativity, you know, it makes the front page. Mm -hmm. What you don't see are a lot of hard working individuals, especially in government, and <coughs> pseudo government people as well, who try to, through diplomacy, resolve polit political problems, okay? I was very fortunate. Um, in 1981, to be asked by Reagan to go to a conference in London, so with uh, Irish people and with British people and with uh, Northern Ireland people, see if there is a way out of the Northern Ireland mess, okay? So I got there and I said, hey, this is great. Now, taking my wife and I off, well, why am I here? They said, oh, you're an academic. I said, what does that mean? That means you write all the reports. Okay, you guys like writing, so write all the reports. So I was able to interview all of the leaders and then say, but what about, so I was taking one guy's thought and going over and listening and saying, well, the other one says this. And the other. So you wind up being what they call track two diplomacy. It's out of the media, okay? But you're trying to get sides to realize what the other one is actually saying but for the media, they have to pompously say one thing or another. But there's a lot of good work going on in, in, on the ground, in my opinion. Tremendous work going on on the ground. Uh, I've known ambassadors who go out of their way to be very helpful for our foreign policy. And in fact, they will go to an extreme, as I mentioned in class, one of the uh, dear friends of mine, Tom Malady, who closed down the embassy in Rwanda when the genocide happened. And that was the first American embassy ever to be closed in the history of the United States. He closed it down because he felt this was totally immoral to even have a, a sense of foreign policy with these people. Okay. And then, of course, they moved him on, <laughs> after he had a stint at St. Joe's, to Uganda. Well, then with Idi Amin, he closed that embassy down. All right? So I love the third embassy that he was given, the Vatican. I figured, you know, <laughs> not too much immorality is going to happen here. But he was there when uh, Noriega went into the Vatican, uh, as, you know, down in uh, Panama. And Tom was able to uh, extract him um, without anybody being harmed. I have many good stories about people that really do that type of, in my opinion, good foreign policy work. But it's not in the media, and it's not on the front page. And you guys are extremely lucky. You have a thing called the internet, okay? You can have access to all information, not only the United States, okay, from overseas. And that, that is a, a real gift if you're interested in knowing what's really going on, okay? Yes? I forget what you said, but um, someone recently said that we're losing in Lebanon <coughs> because Hezbollah is building more schools and, and hospitals. I'm not saying that, you know, the military should be doing humanitarian work, but in terms of, you know, playing that ideology of terrorism, um, how, can, how can we combat that rather than just military means? I guess get uh, the Red Cross to donate um, books and um, CRS to donate some young teachers. So we could be doing those, getting NGOs uh, or intergovernmental agencies. And so they're a terrorist group. So. Anwar Sadat, okay, yeah. And you have Jerry Adams, an IRA killer. Yeah. You can run your whole list of individuals who were violent, they were given the name terrorist, and then were given an opportunity to be politically powerful, they, they, they change. They change the color like a chameleon just because they realize they're being dealt with as a human being. Uh, I, as you know, the United States does not have direct contact with anyone on the terrorist list. But if you have crazy people like myself, I will go talk to them. All right? mm -hmm. And then I come back, and then I chat with the government, and the people that are talking with me know that the information is going back. Okay? And I, I feel it's, a, um, it's an obligation. Okay, I've been given this information, I've been given these opportunities, but the government then hears what's going on and can deal with it, especially in military junta type of uh, communities. 
like Venezuela and all. How do you actually get into the countryside to find out what's going on? Well, you have these NGO, hard-working individuals. They come back to the States to see their family, and they sit down at lunch in Washington, D.C., and there happen to be interesting guys, suit coat and tie, little thing in their ear, you know. And you know they're from the uh, National Security Agency. Okay. You, you see them all. You can just tell by the way they dress and how they conduct themselves. You know that they're CIA and national security people. And they're getting information. So I open up. I figured, hey, I'm an American, and you want this United States. The more aware you are, the less mistakes you'll make. That I found out when I worked for the UN, okay? That the more aware I was of what's going on in other countries, I wouldn't be making full pause and talking to other colleagues that were working at the UN. So I found out, hey, yeah, it really does work uh, on a lower level. Subsidiarity, all right? Get it down to a level where it really makes a contact. Any other questions? Okay, you're easily satisfied. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate it. I think there's refreshments in the back there.